Well, hi, everybody. Oh, that's pathetic. Really? Hi, everybody. Thank you. Much better. Well, hi. Welcome to, uh, what are we talking about today? The beautiful microservice. Uh, <coughs> I haven't been here in a while, so I'm super happy to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Couple of things. We're going to talk about code today. I love code. Code is great. So if you want to follow along, uh, please do. But there's also the code online. Uh, you know, roughly what we're going to do is online on GitHub there. A um, little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. I'm a Spring developer advocate on the on the Spring team at Pivotal. Author of uh, you know five almost books now on Spring and distributed systems and cloud native computing. Uh, a Java champion, that's new. I wasn't one of those when I was here last. An open source contributor to the likes of things like Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, both of which we'll talk about here today. Um, and at your service, OK? I'm forever at your service. So I'm online. Uh, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to take this discussion further or forward, uh, above and beyond this room, if you leave this room more confused than when you entered, you have recourse. Don't hesitate to find me. How many of you? are on the Twitters. Twitter, it's 2015. How many of you are on Twitter? 2015. 2015. Twitter, OK, awkward, awkward. What about email? How many of you are on email? <laughs> email, email. No one, OK. Well, if you have questions via either of those channels, please don't hesitate to, re hesitate to reach out to me. I do have one important sort of perfunctory thing that we must absolutely address up front and from the get-go, lest, uh, lest we forget. I need all of you, in the most concerted, cheerful way you can, to say open source on my prompt so I can take an epic DevOxy, or, or what I'm now calling a selfie at DevOx. Okay, now, you don't have to, to like it, but do smile, okay? So here we go, here we go. This is going to be great. Now just, just hold still. This is basically why I come here, is for the DevOxies, OK? So on my mark, say, open source. Oh, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. So I work at a small company, a startup called Pivotal. How many of you have heard of Pivotal? Pivotal. So we're, we're a, a startup in the valley. We're the new home of lots of great open source technologies. How many of you have heard of Tomcat? Tomcat. Anybody? No one. OK. Awkward. What about, what about RabbitMQ? RabbitMQ. Redis. It's a distributed data structure server used by some small mom and pop shops like, uh, like Twitter. Twitter. OK. Uh, what, about, what about Spring? How many of you have heard of Spring? What about Spring Boot? OK. What about Cloud Foundry? So Cloud Foundry is an open source platform. You know, it's optimized for the continuous and safe delivery of applications into production. Right? Uh, Cloud Foundry is an open source project, so you can deploy it in your own data center. But there are distributions by other vendors, sort of like the Linux kernel relationship to, to companies like Red Hat and Ubuntu. Right? Uh, we, are the found, we provide the base image. The community provides the base image. And then companies build upon that. So there are some very, very promising upstart companies that are building their distributions on top of, on top of Cloud Foundry. How many of you have heard of IBM? I, IBM. IBM. No one. OK. What about HP? HP. No? No one. S A S A P S A P. Okay, well, that is discouraging. Well, anyway, you watch this space. Those those are going to be some big companies. Uh, and again, we all we all agree that getting applications to production is a very important thing. We at Pivotal love production. We love moving apps to production. We think it's one of the most important things we can do is to help customers and users deliver software safely and quickly to production. We think about production all the time at Pivotal. We have brochures. Most companies, you'll see people with little brochures, the dream getaway to Hawaii or something like that. At Pivotal, we have brochures for that dream getaway to production. 
We love production. We think it's the happiest place on earth, better than Disneyland, right? Production is awesome. And we've seen our users and our customers and, and the community at large struggle with how to get there faster. And it's not just us, it's, it's been this way for the last several, I don't know, almost 10 years now, right? We understand that we want to get code to production. But there are things that frustrate our ability to do that. We've seen organizations where you have a large code base, and the code base has lots of developers. Well, of course, each time you make a commit, each time you change some code, you have to wait for the entire team and all these different people to stabilize and synchronize their code in order to be able to deploy it. We've also seen that there's a, a large workflow, a sort of uh, waste that happens in your average organization where a team of developers will be but one station in a long sort of factory or a conveyor belt of, of stations. The first of which, of course, is product management and then user experience people, then the developers, and then you throw that beautiful code you've worked on so hard. And most of us are doing agile, of course, as developers, but we take that beautiful code that we've worked on so hard, throw it over the wall, and, and then we give it to the Q&A people and then the, uh, you know, the various administrators, the network administrators, the operations people. And this queuing from one station to another, it creates clock time. It creates waste. In, in lean manufacturing, we talk about waste. This inventory that we get by queuing work from one place to another creates clock time. That means that even if the developers are doing agile development, it may take weeks, even if the developers only took days, to get software into production. We call this very odd phenomenon, water scrum fall, right? Where you've got, you've got a waterfall process sandwiching agile, otherwise agile developers. And this is a problem because it means you as developers and we as developers cannot get software into production where it can do the most good. Remember, most of us are in a software business. Uh, w. Edwards Demings talks about that. He's a, one of the original luminaries of the DevOps world. He says, change is not required Nobody says you have to survive, right? Our ability to s change in the marketplace, to be able to react to those forces as a software business is the first thing we can do to help the business. And if we frustrate that process with all these different wasteful, you know, slow uh, inventory points, then we lose the ability to react. So a lot of people, a lot of organizations have been looking for ways to do smaller batches of code, smaller batches of services. And this, of course, implies moving to something like microservices. So you take a large monolithic code base, make it smaller so that I can write code, test it, certify it, and then ship it as quickly as possible. Also, we've seen organizations move to this new paradigm where instead of having operations and so on, that just becomes some sort of automatic platform, something like Cloud Foundry, right? This shortens the turnaround time from an idea to production. This is very, very important, and it's what large companies like high-performance organizations like Netflix and Etsy and so on, these are the things that they have championed is respawn quicker and you can deliver better value, even if it's, at the time, more expensive. It's cheaper to do something more expensive quicker than it is to, so to do something less expensive over time, most of the time. Right, so now you've agreed. We, we need to do microservices because we want to move faster, right? That's the fundamental reason why we should embrace microservices. There are some other technological benefits, of course. Sure, you get better runtime scale because now you can load balance and you can scale up just the individual bits that you care about. That's one true benefit, of course. Uh, another benefit, of course, is that by formalizing the boundaries between each service, you've made the domain internally consistent. Eric Myers, or Eric Evans, rather, uh, in his canonical tome, Domain Driven Design, calls this a bounded context. And it's actually good hygiene for your data, right? So you want that as well. But this does invite complexity, right? By moving to this microservices world, you've now moved squarely into the camp of distributed computing. And that is not a fun place to be unless you have support for the problems you're going to run into in that world. What we're going to talk about today is Spring Cloud, which builds atop Spring Boot. Spring Cloud codifies the sort of patterns, the things you're going to need in order to build applications and handle these non-functional requirements. So we're going to work first with Spring Boot. How many of you have seen a talk about Spring Boot or, uh, or have heard of it or, or even maybe know somebody who knew somebody who fell down and hit somebody else who knew Spring Boot? Anybody? Okay. So we're going to start with Spring Boot. <clears throat> That's my slides. I worked very hard on those. What do you think of my slides? Best ever? They were pretty good, weren't they? 
Okay, so we're going to go to my uh, second favorite place on the web here. This is after production, of course. This is start.spring.io. And I love start.spring.io. After production, it's my favorite place. Like I say, keep it under your pillow. If ever you're, you're un at, at, at uh, sort of an unease, you can go to start.spring.io. If you're lacking inspiration, start.spring.io. If your kids are restless and you want them to sleep, start.spring.io. If you have indigestion and you want to feel better, Start that spring that I owe. Now this is a great place to go start your adventures with spring. Okay, so I'm going to choose the RC ones because I want to show you some cool stuff. I think we have enough time. We've got 50 minutes. I'm going to go fast. By the way, my friends, this is not to teach you how to do any one thing along the way here. It's to teach you that it's all possible and that you can pull it down uh, by looking at the code and by looking at start that spring that I owe. Don't be, um, don't worry about catching all the details. We're going to go fast. That's the goal here: is to go fast and and just pile on as much as we can. So I'm going to build a service, my typical uh, service. I'm going to build a service that uses an H2 embedded database. It'll use JPA because I make poor life decisions. So JPA. I'm going to create a REST API. So I'll use REST repositories. I'll bring in actuator support for operationalizing my application. I also want to bring in the config client only for the side effect of having brought in um, a repository. And I'm going to bring in Eureka discovery support. Okay. I'm going to name this reservation service. And I'm going to hit generate. Now, I should mention that there are other options here, right? You can choose the description, the package name, uh, the, the version of the language you uh, like to use, Java or Groovy, and of course, this one, right? Do you want to use a jar or a war? <laughs> a jar or a war. Now, we are all about choice on the Spring team. We believe in that very firmly. Uh, we have these both here. If you are by some fluke of physics, stuck in the distant past, unable to move forward to the present, which is actually just today, so it's not even really the future, then choose war. <laughs> but if you're here with me today, in 2015, then choose jar. Now, this is part of my f personal philosophy of make jar, not war. Now, you have choices. <laughs> you have choices. You have options. We care about them. They're both supported, OK? Right on. Good. So I have generated my first lowly service here. I'm going to open this up in my IDE. You can use whatever you want. I'm going to use uh, IntelliJ. This works in everything. Actually, it works really nicely in everything. You can use the uh, stock Eclipse, because it's just Maven and Java. You can use uh, the Spring Tool Suite, of course, which is our distribution with some extra bits on top of Eclipse. You can use NetBeans. It works great. Um, you know, use whatever you like. So. I have a stock standard Maven build here. I won't go over the details too much, but suffice it to say, we have opinionated dependencies. These dependencies, in turn, bring in everything else we need, so we don't have to play whack-a-mole with version ranges. Uh, I'm going to comment out a few things, because we don't need them just yet. And the goal here is to stand up a quick REST API that we're going to talk to. What? OK with it. Go away. So let me see. We're going to say reservation service application. I'm going to build an application that simply manages entities of type reservation. This is going to be sort of like a, um, a restaurant reservation. You know, There's an app called OpenTable. Have you, have you played with OpenTable? I love it because it's a very simple domain, and to me it seems a little pointless. Uh, but I, I think we should you know, create a reservation in that way. The idea is that you can go to the application and Find a restaurant, click on some times, uh, log in, create an account, you know, certify that you're you, check, click on the confirmation email, um, and then finally, if you're lucky, you'll have a reservation at the restaurant, or you could just call and say, I'll be there at 8. But either way, you get the work done, right? So I'm going to create a reservation entity that'll just be something we'll use to store. I don't really care about the domain model. We're not interested in the domain model so much as we are uh, the fact that I have an entity, right? Um, so. So there's that. Okay, it's gonna be a JP entity like so. I'll say at entity, and uh, I need two string naturally. So this is that. Um, okay, there we are. Good, and I want a repository, something I can use to ha make short work of the common CRUD style stuff: create, read, update, and delete. So I'm gonna say JP repository, extending a JP repository from Spring Data to handle entities of type reservation whose primary key is of type long. Naturally, there are other repositories in Spring Data, like 
uh, Cassandra and you know MongoDB and Neo4j and so on, but I'm, I'm going to use JPA. I can even define custom finder methods here. So I'm going to say find by reservation name string rn. And what I want to do is I want to handle exporting the state of my business entities, the, the, the mutations that these business entities are going to go through, creation, reading, updating, and deleting. I want to stand that up and export it as a REST API to map HTTP verbs to those state transitions. So I'm going to say at REST resource path is by name. And I'll say I want this to be a repository that will be exported to HTTP REST using Spring Data REST. And whoops, I'm going to go ahead and install some some dummy data, OK? So uh, here we go, component, class, dummy data, CLR, implements, command line runner. And I'm going to, it's a callback interface. So when Spring Boot starts up, it's going to see this command line runner interface, and it's going to call the run method, passing in the string argument array from public static void main string args. So I'm going to say stream of Dave, Stefan, Nina. Oliver, St uh, Stefan, is that the right one? Maybe one, I think, there we go. Um, Mark, right? So there's some names. I'm going to say for each name in that uh, collection, let's call this dot, this dot uh, reservation repository. I'm going to inject the repository that I want to use here. And I'm going to say call reservation repository dot save new reservation passing in the name, OK? And then I'm going to go down here. I'm going to say find all of the records and then print them out just so we can confirm that the records have been saved to database, our in-memory database. And just for, for uh, fun, I'm going to also find my good friend Mr. Hazel here for each, and then print line that one as well, OK? Now we'll restart, and we'll confirm that the data has been written to the database. OK. There it is. So there's the data there, right? So that, of course, worked, right? This is a demo. Naturally, that was going to work. Um, Localhost reservations. If we go to 8080, forward slash reservations, you can see I have a very simple hypermedia REST API, right? Hadi OS. This is a hypermedia as the en engine of application state. The idea is that every REST resource should I have information enough for the client to be able to further navigate that REST API without any a priori knowledge, right? So here, I have a payload that shows me all the re reservations in the reservations collection. And then for each one, I have a collection of links that tell me that if I want to get back to the current rec record, I go to self. If I want to add other links, I can add that as well. And the idea is that I can be very, very smart about state. I can say, oh, well, if you have a shopping cart and I have items in the shopping cart that haven't been paid for, I won't show them a link to get a refund, right? The client navigates by the links. It doesn't navigate by uh, deep knowledge of the links, right? Deep links. And this decouples the client from the URL structure, which means that if you wanted to change the URL structure, you can. As long as they can follow the, the breadcrumbs from forward slash, look at the links, go to the URL for reservations, see that there's even more links here. There's links to the search engine, for example, the search page. And what do I want to do on the search page? Well, I can find an endpoint to search by reservation name. So I'm going to say rn equals uh, Oliver. And did I call the wrong endpoint? Did I even annotate it? Oh, I forgot to do this. Well, that would have been cooler if it worked, wouldn't it? OK, so that's there. Now I've got a basic REST API. Now, Obviously, if you build a REST API in the forest and no one connects to it, there's an existential question here. Did you actually build it, right? Uh, in a distributed systems world, you want to be able to connect to these things. And when you start creating more than one service, you run into these patterns that aren't so or pains that aren't so problematic uh, in, limited, in a limited scope, but they become a big problem when you have more than one service and you want to manage them. So uh, this is all fine. We have an API now that is easy to, to use. Thanks to Spring Boot and the actuator, I also get insight into what the application is doing. I can go to forward slash metrics, for example, and I can see the state of the application, go to E and V to see the properties and so on. I get, I get to see what the application is doing. Uh, but I want to manage certain things, like, for example, configuration. What about, you know, we, we know that Spring Boot supports 12-factor style configuration, where you externalize passwords and, and so on using environment variables or dash D arguments. But that becomes a little untenable in a distributed system when you have more than one service. Suppose I want to pass in a password. Do I really want passwords unencrypted? 
being passed and in invisible in PSAUX? Of course not, right? What about uh, you know, supporting symmetric decryption and encryption? So if I have a cipher, I can decrypt a password and then uh, in transit decrypt it and then use it in the application. How do I change a password or, or change properties for a service in one place and then update multiple versions of it? Right? So I have to log into every node and restart and re, re, you know, update the, uh, the properties? What about <coughs> live or feature flags, that kind of thing, where you want to change certain things at runtime without having to restart all the processes? There's a lot of different use cases that, while Spring Boot provides a good start, we need a little bit more when it comes to a distributed system. So we're going to use Spring Cloud's config server. And I'm going to go back here to start.spring.io, and I'll stand up an instance of it. I'll just uh, RMRF this stuff here. There we are. I'm going to say config server, and I'll rename this config server, and hit generate. Okay. Now this is going to be a REST API in front of a repository of configuration, a repository that I want to be able to journal. I want to be able to see what happened. If Let's suppose Josh finishes his talk and goes off to Beer Central and has too much quack beer and then logs into production and starts making changes. How do we see what happened when something goes south? How do we journal that? How do we audit it and see what happened and then, if necessary, roll back? We can do all sorts of things and there's some discipline required, but it turns out that things like Git are very good at solving that exact problem, right? So what we want to do is stand up a REST API that'll sit in front of a repository of configuration files for us. So I'm going to go to my code here and I'll say at enable config server. Then I'm going to go to application.properties and I'm going to tell Spring Boot, can you all see that type up there? Yeah, it's fairly large. I'm going to tell Spring Boot where to find the configuration. So sp Spring Cloud config server git URI equals, and this could be anything. It could be a GitHub URL, a GitLab URL, anything on HTTP or your local file system. In my case, I happen to have, I happen to have a directory full of config files here on my desktop. So I want to access these config files and I want to make, th make them available. I'm going to say forward slash home, forward slash desktop, forward slash config. And finally, I'm going to tell the server to stand up and listen on port 8888. Here we are. All right. Good stuff. Thank you. So, localhost 8888 forward slash reservation service forward slash master. What I'm, what I'm showing you here is the REST API that we just stood up. Right? This is a REST API that is going to sit in front of our repository of configuration files and for a service of the name reservation-service, looking for the master profile, it will get two sets of configuration files. The configuration file reservation-service.properties, which in this case has certain well-known properties, these three keys and values, and as a fall-through, application.properties. So for every microservice, no matter what its name or identification, <coughs> those services will get the properties that are defined in application.properties but only the microservice that identifies itself as reservation service that properties will get the configuration in reservation service that properties should there be a conflict as there is in this case the more specifically named reservation uh, service that properties overrides the general application that properties so server dot port is defined here and it's defined here the more specific wins okay now if we have a rest api and this is a natural place to do symmetric encryption, decryption. It's a natural place to do a lot of great things by decoupling the client away from the, the, the repository of configuration. Let's connect our reservation service to talk to this. Okay? We're also going to take advantage of this message. I've got a string here, a message. And I want to be able to inject it and reference it from my reservation service that we've just stood up. So I'll go back here. And I'm going to stand up a new REST API. I'll say at REST controller class message REST controller. And I'm going to inject the value here. I'll say message, private string message. And I'm just going to expose an endpoint that'll just parrot the value of the string uh, whenever I ask for it. Okay. So here we are. Return this dot message. Now this is using Spring's property placeholder resolution mechanism. It's just going to provide the message key from some configuration source, in this case, the, uh, the Spring Cloud config server. In order to talk to that Spring Cloud config server, I need to act as a client. So I'm going to go back and 
reintroduce the Spring Cloud Starter Config dependency, which is going to bring in the bits that I need to be able to talk to a config server. I'm also going to make it so that when I want to reevaluate this message, I can by triggering a refresh. Now, in order for the config server to, to talk to the, uh, the, the, in order for the client to talk to the server, I need to tell it what its name is so it can find the right properties, and I need to tell it where the config server lives. So I'm going to say spring that application name equals reservation hyphen service and spring cloud config URI is HTTP localhost 8888. Now, this property file that I'm using here, by default, Spring Boot will look in application.properties and it'll load all the keys and values in there and make them available for injection. But what I'm trying to do is something a little bit more crafty. I'm trying to tell Spring Boot to call a REST API to get its configuration keys and values when it starts up. Naturally, this configuration has to be read before the rest of the configuration. So we put it by convention in the text file called bootstrap.properties. And that is basically the only, you know, key and value that you'll have, those two properties, are the only thing you're going to have when you create more microservices. So if that's working, then I should be able to restart this. And without adding any more configuration to the mix here, I should be able to see the message key from the reservation service uh, properties file here, where it says message. And uh, if I go back to my application, localhost, First of all, 8,000, right? So we change the port that's in the property file. There's that. And now if we go to message, I get the message from the property file. But this message isn't really, this isn't a great message. It's a good message. I tried. It, it says the name of the conference. That's a start. But uh, I think it lacks that je ne sais quoi. You know, it needs a little bit more oomph. So I'm going to open this up. I'm going to add more exclamation marks because that makes the opinion more valid on Reddit. Okay. I'm going to say git commit minus m YOLO, OK? Now, when I go to the config server, you can see the config server is immediately aware of my uh, stronger opinion. But my actual application has no idea of what just happened. I have to tell it what has changed. In order to do that, I need to re trigger a refresh. So I'm going to say curl minus d HTTP localhost. 8,000 forward slash refresh. So what I'm doing is I'm telling the application that I wanted to call all the beans that I annotated with at refresh scope and reconfigure the beans, discard the internal proxy, pull down the configuration. So there's that, and then refresh, right? And the new values are visible immediately. Right? So this lets me do feature flags. I can do live reload. You like that? That's cool. I'm a fan. Cool. So that, that's one property that you're going to need to support. Distributed con you know, configuration, centralized configuration. Naturally, as you start to build more services, uh, you create a web, right? You have a lot of services that talk to each other. There's a, uh, a complexity cost that arises. How do you discover where these services are? You could, of course, use DNS, but this is a poor fit in a microservices world where services tend to, <coughs> pardon the pun, spring to life you know, as, as demand and capacity dictate. So you want to be able to decouple where a service lives and from what the service is, right? The name of it, the logical mapping of that service to its home and place. Especially if you have more than one instance of a service. You could put a service or two behind a load balancer, but how does a client know if a service that it's about to call is sick and it just hasn't been you know, uh, jettisoned from the load balancing uh, ensemble, right? So this information is something that you don't want to uh, let a load balancer handle for you. Additionally, even if you are using a load balancer in DNS, uh, with, remember, DNS has time to live, cache expiry you know, problems, and the load balancer only has so many settings it can support. If I'm trying to do load balancing across 10 different services and I want to do round robin, your, your typical load balancer will support that. But what if I want to do, for example, multi-tenancy? What if I want to route to a specific set of nodes given a certain set of IDs? Or what if I want to do um, load availability zone awareness? I want to route to certain zones based on the the you know, Amazon Web Services zone or whatever your cloud provider zone is, right? Or what if I want to do um, something sticky? Perhaps I'm streaming a video or something and I want to route all nodes to the status endpoint on a specific node for a given token, a security token, right? All of these kinds of requirements are beyond what your average checkbox on your average load balancer will do. So to support this use case, we're going to introduce a uh, service registry, okay? We're going to use Eureka, which is a service registry, uh, from Netflix, though there are others, right? So we're going to use the Eureka Discovery. 
Naturally, there's Zookeeper, there's Console, and so on, right? We're going to introduce a abstraction um, to, we're going to use an abstraction to talk to this, this uh, service registry. Naturally, we're going to stand it up first. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the start.spring.io, and I'm going to install an instance of Eureka. Now, Eureka is from Netflix, uh, who, by the by, also use um, Spring Cloud and Spring Boot. How many of you have heard of Netflix? Netflix. Netflix. So they're, they're pretty big now. Um, I saw an interesting thing that suggested that on the internet, there are three, the three largest video categories are, number one is pornography, just the entire category, right? Number two is Netflix, and number three by less than half is YouTube, which is crazy. It's crazy. It's huge. Something like 80% of the bandwidth on the internet apparently is, uh, you know, lazy Americans sitting on their couch watching Netflix every evening, you know, drooling, right? That's a big thing. It's, and now it's here, it's, now it's everywhere, right? So they're building on Spring Cloud to, to sort of move faster as well. So I've got this application. I'm going to go ahead and Eureka service application. I'll say at enable Eureka server. Uh, wrong dependency. Starter Eureka server at enable auto import. And there we are. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm selling Spring Boot that this node is going to act as a registry. It's going to be the same kind of thing as before. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to say your name is Eureka service. And it's going to talk to the config server running on port 8888. Uh, and it needs to be a bootstrapped up properties. So I'll rename it thusly. And now I'll restart. So Eureka server application. The configuration that I have in the config server says that it's going to run in port 8761, absent any specific value. So I can go to localhost 8761, and I get the config server. Uh, Eureka service. Did I add the config client? Config server. Rats. Sad. So there we are. So that'll, that'll come up, and that's a service registry. Now, while that's doing that, I want to go back and teach my reservation service to be aware of this discovery service, of this registry. What I want is for one service to be able to find another and not be aware of its DNS entry or of its host and port. So there's a little bit of decoupling here. By given a logical ID, like, for example, reservation service, I want to be able to discover where other applications live. Hello. Mm -hmm. Eureka service. Spring Cloud Starter Eureka Service. What is the pro pro problem? Server? On the Eureka server? Mm -hmm. Let's try that. <coughs> um, okay, restart. So anyway, there it is, and all of its service registry glory. Now what I want to do is I want to teach my services to register themselves here. There's a REST API as well as this wetware screen. The REST APIs will talk to the API, but of course, we, we, we bits of wetware can look at this console to see what's happening. So now, let's go back to our reservation service here and, at, and restore a dependency on the Spring Cloud Starter Eureka. What this is going to do is it's going to enable the discovery client abstraction. And the abstraction is just a, it's an interface that can be used to talk to a discovery service like Eureka or Netflix uh, or, or Zookeeper or, or console or whatever. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to add at enable discovery client. Now the discovery client abstraction is read only, right? It doesn't specifically imply that you're going to do writing. Because remember, not all service registries require you to do writing. In this case, what I want to do is I want to say, when the reservation service starts up, I want it to volunteer that I'm here. If you need me, I'm here. My host and port are, are as follows, and my name is res you know, reservation-service. But if you're using a cloud platform, like for example, Cloud Foundry, 
it already knows where a given service lives given its logical mapping, right? You don't have to tell it that that service is available at this host and port. It already knows. So it's read-only in that case. So we don't imply that in the contract. Now, if I go back here and refresh, you'll see that reservation service is here. Uh, and it says that it's on uh, this IP or this ID at this port. And now I want to build a client now, okay? We want to build a client to talk to our service. And this is where we're going to have some fun. So I'm going to build a new service here, a reservation client, that's going to act as an edge service. It's going to use Eureka Discovery, of course. It'll use config client. It'll use Hystrix for circuit breakers. It'll use, um, what else do I want? I want stream support with RabbitMQ. I want distributed tracing with Zipkin. I want Hi Hypermedia, right? The Hypermedia API for the, the support for that. Uh, actuator, naturally. Good, so now I've built my, my client. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna build an edge service. So when we talk about edge services in a distributed system, there are two different types of edge services. One is an API gateway, which is good for API protocol, API or protocol translation from an outside service, an outside client like a phone or something, into some sort of backend call. You're gonna call the suite of microservices as registered in the registry. Or just a simple micro proxy, right? And it depends on your use cases, but uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna show a little bit of both here, right? So let's take, for example, the first use case. I've got this application. It's a client to my backend microservice. It's going to call the reservation service and, and get data. Uh, the reason we stand up API gateways like this is because, um, is because we have clients like iPhones or watches or Android devices or Playstations or Rokus or whatever. We have different types of clients that speak different protocols for security. They have different use cases. They want to get different views on the same data, etc. Take, for example, HTML5. HTML5 requires that you don't run afoul of cross-origin request scripting uh, you know, uh, restrictions. So you have to s channel everything through the same host and port. Or you can optionally add a policy document to every service saying that I, re I accept requests from this endpoint. But imagine something like Netflix where they have 600 different microservices. For them, the option of retrofitting every single microservice every single time each client needs a new change or a specific uh, you know, new policy document, it's not an option. They don't have the time to redeploy 600 different services just because there's an HTML5 client. So instead, they stand up a specific Android or HTML5 uh, edge service. In, HTML, in the HTML5 use case, uh, it, might be, it, might be enough just to, it might be enough just to proxy requests. What if I just have one service that forwards all requests to the registered microservices in the back end, right? So I'm gonna go back to my build here. I'm gonna make sure that I have Zool. Okay, now, if you are f good on your um, uh, Ghostbusters mythology, how many of you are good on Ghostbusters? Ghostbusters? How many of you remember Zool, the cutest little monster you've ever seen? That's the gatekeeper, the guardian of the underworld, right? Zool is the door, doorman, or door monster in this case, not to be racist, Zool. Um, it's the door monster that guards access to the underworld. And so what we want to do is we want to stand up a proxy that'll take requests from the outside and forward them to the backend microservices that we've registered in our registry. So I'm going to go ahead and say at enable auto import, and I'll say spring cloud starter Zool. And then we're going to go ahead and start the application up. Okay. Now, what this is going to do is just going to forward the request very simply. So if we have an HTML5 client, we might add HTTP basic authentication, some SSL, and then we're done. Maybe that's enough, right? That would be a, certainly a good start. So localhost, this is running on port 9999, right? Forward slash reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations, okay? Oh, I forgot to give it this stuff, didn't I? Bootstrap. Client, go faster. Oh. Come on. Oh. Registering. We okay? Disabled. What is disabled? 
Thank you, buddy. There we are. So while this is restarting, I was just reminded of something that I wanted to take issue with. I think we're friends here. We can talk about this openly and not have any grievances. So I'm a big IntelliJ fan. Um, and I think you'll notice that we have really, really amazing ASCII artwork in Spring Boot now. Now, this ASCII artwork, I think, is one of our defining features. That was a lot of great stuff, but the ASCII artwork really helps bridge the communities, bridge the gaps. So I think that we should start a petition. I'm just saying, what the hell is that? Why is that there, right? We should get that removed. That's, that doesn't help anybody. So anyway, whatever. So there's my service, OK? 99, 99, forward slash reservation service, forward slash reservations. Now, this is the registered service in the registry. If I had a service called foo service, then I could call foo hyphen service, forward slash whatever, and I'd proxy directly to that. I've got a little bit of indirection here. Like I said, if I add basic authentication or OAuth or something, maybe SSL, I'm done. That would be enough. But of course, that would be a terrible demo, so I'm not done, right? Let's talk about API gateways or API uh, translation, right? So in this case, we're just doing a direct proxy, a direct forward to the registered service. And if I want to do the composition or, or aggregation or whatever in the client, in JavaScript, for example, I can. But it's nice to somehow sometimes stand up a, a middle API, an API that'll sit and do translation for whatever reason. So in this case, I want to stand up a REST controller. I'll say at REST controller class reservation API gateway gate way rest controller Whew. and i'm going to map it to request mappings forward slash reservation so i'm going to stand up an endpoint that forwards requests to the backend services maybe one or more maybe there's an aggregate view or something and does some sort of basic translation the first endpoint will simply respond to http get and it'll return forward slash name so i can go to forward slash reservations forward slash names and get a collection of strings for the reservation names. So I'll say get reservation names. And I'm going to use the REST template here, the auto-configured REST template, which already knows about our, our um, service registry, to make the call. Now, the REST template is an HTTP client that makes short work of common HTTP in exchanges, you know, delete, get, post, etc. I'm going to say that I want to call HTTP colon forward slash forward slash HTTP, or rather reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations. Mind you, that is not DNS. That's the service ID as we registered in Eureka. The Spring, the, uh, Spring Cloud auto configuration adds an interceptor that'll take all HTTP requests, resolve the, the uh, service by its ID, go to Eureka or whatever, find all the instances, one or n instances, and pass it to something called Ribbon. Now, Ribbon is a software-defined load balancer. It, it's the component that I described earlier that lets you programmatically make the decision about which nodes to route the request to. This gives you more flexibility because now you can version, test, and then deploy the routing you need for your service, even if other services get something else. So I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to leave the default, which is, by the way, in this case, to do round robin. I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to say that it's going to be an HTTP get call. Since it's a get call, there's no body. And I need to tell Java what value I want back from the, uh, the HTTP call. Now, here I'm going to use the parameterized type reference. Okay, so parameterized type reference of type resources from Spring Hot OS of type reservation. Now, what I'm doing is I'm giving the REST template a type token. This is a, a pattern to capture generic parameters at runtime, right? Because of type erasure, you can't capture generic parameters of instance variables. That's why you're forced to capture them in the subclass. That's what we're doing here. This is an abstract class, and I'm forced to subclass it, which effectively bakes this generic argument into the instance, which I can then pass to this. And that'll tell the REST template via reflection that I want a response that has the Spring Hypermedia resources object with the body and the links, as well as the reservation object. Now, this may make you wonder, what reservation object? Remember, we're building a client to a service. In theory, and again, this is hypothetical, right? I mean, I have never seen this demonstrated to my satisfaction. But in theory, that service that we're calling could be built using something besides Spring and Java. Now, again, big hypothetical, right? Um, and because of that, we don't want to be coupled to the implementation of the service representation of that, of that entity. So we're going to create a client-side mirror here. I'm just going to say class reservation. And I'll say private long ID 
private string reservation name, and I'll create some getters, voila. And there we go. So now I've got Spring Hypermedia and the reservation entity. I'm passing that there. It's going to give me a return value like that. And I'm going to say that I want to return exchange dot. And I can, call the, I can get the status code. I can get the, uh, the body, the headers, etc. I want to get the body. Then I want to get the content, which is the collection of resources. Then I want to stream and map from reservation to reservation name. And then I'm going to collect the results and return them. Now, this is a great use of Java 8, Lambdas, and functional programming. Uh, if I were using calling more than one service, naturally, I would want to use something like uh, RxJava or, or whatever to concurrently call these services and then zip the results back up and send them back that way. But since I'm only calling one service, I'm just going to do the work here in a very imperative style. This is going to give me an endpoint that will return a subset of the data. It's an API translation. And this will work. This is you know very, very simple, but it will work. Um, so we are here, reservations forward slash names, faster I say. There we are. So there's my names coming from the reservation service. Reading via REST is a very good way to go, but naturally in a distributed system when you want to write, you can't really trust on REST, you can't really trust REST to, to be the, you know, the guarantee that you need. Uh, if you write something and, and, you, and the REST service is down, what are you going to do, right? You don't want to be coupled to the availability of that service. So a lazy architect at this point would reach for something like distributed transactions. Avoid this urge at all costs. Pro tip. Um, instead, the high-performance, high-performing organizations use messaging or asynchronous writes. They use something like CQRS, which optimizes for the fact that writing via messaging is very, very fast, and it's safe, right? It's eventually consistent. So we support that uh, with Spring Cloud Stream, right? So Spring Cloud Stream is a way of logically composing microservices in the same way that we're using the Eureka Service Registry to compose microservices via REST. We can use messaging to compose streams of messaging flows using their service IDs instead of being too worried about the, uh, you know, where ser services are registered and so on. So I've got Spring Cloud Stream on the class path here. I've added uh, Spring Cloud uh, Starter Stream Rabbit. So this is going to talk to RabbitMQ. I could as easily talk to Redis or Kafka or whatever, right? But what I want to do is I want to write messages to the service. So I'm going to go back to my code here. Now, what I'm trying to do in my reservation client is to create another API gateway endpoint to write data. I'm going to say post. And I'm going to just say any post to the reservations endpoint will call, uh, you know, write um, request body reservation. And I'm going to say that I want to send a message to some other system to handle the write eventually, right? State synchronization via messaging is a very, very powerful thing. Remember, even the banks don't use distributed transactions, right? There's, it's too imperformant. So you want to scale, you use messaging. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to inject a message channel, a Spring Integration message channel, to send a message from the client to the service. I want that wiring to happen implicitly using Spring Cloud Stream. So I'll say, at enable binding. And I'll say that this is a source component. So I'm going to bring in Spring Cloud Stream messaging source.class. This is an interface. You can use any interface. You don't even have to use this. The only redeeming quality is that it's got an interface definition message channel output, and a qualifier annotation saying output. Spring Cloud Stream is going to implicitly create that channel, which is just a named pipe. It's a conduit through, message, through which messages are sent. The benefit of this is that our client code can work with the type, the message channel type, uh, and we don't have to worry about it too much. The wiring of how those services communicate with each other is left to configuration. So if we go to the config service and the reservation service, here's reservation client master. You can see that I've got uh, Spring Cloud Stream Bindings Output equals reservation. So for the lo for the local ID of output, I'm going to meet. I'm going to send a message to some exchange or destination called reservations. What does that mean in terms of the messaging sub subsystem? It depends. In this case, it's going to be uh, an exchange on RabbitMQ called reservations, and we're going to let Spring Cloud uh, talk to RabbitMQ which is running on my Docker image here. And I've got spring.rabbitmq.host equals Docker IP. 
So that's already configured for me. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, whenever somebody injects that message channel, go ahead and send the message to message channel that output, and then write. So here we go. So I'll say at autowired private message channel. And I'll use the qualifier. I'll say at output uh, source dot output. That's the qualifier, the string. I'm saying give me the one message whose channel is identified like that. Uh, I'm going to say this dot message channel dot write or send message builder dot with payload r dot get reservation name uh, and then build and then send. Okay, so that's the client side of the, the discussion. I want to do the same trick on the server side, so on the, on the service that's going to respond to the requests. So I'll go to the reservation service here, which is here. I'll say at enable binding, and I'm going to bring in Spring Cloud Stream as well here. So I'll bring in uh, the same dependency from this one, config server, configuration client, Spring Cloud Starter Stream Rabbit. Okay. At enable binding is going to be a source. So a source is the opposite. It's an output channel. Okay. Okay. And a sync is uh, an input channel. It's going to receive data. And I'm going to say that I want to use Spring's messaging subsystem here. I'll say at enable or enable messaging, not messaging. Component scan. Message. Component. Integration component. There we go. So that's going to turn on the support for messaging based components, like you know, uh, asynchronous messaging driven components. I'm going to create a message endpoint here. I'll say that the endpoint is going to receive reservations, message acceptor, and it's going to respond to all messages that come in on the channel provided by the sync, right? So input channel equals sync.input, same trick as before. I'm going to say public void accept, and the response, the, the, meta, the payload will be a string, uh, and then I'll just pass it to my uh, repository and actually write the data to the database. So I'll say private message, or sorry, reservation repository. This.reservation.repository.save equals new reservation passing in RN. So that should be everything I need to be, to be able to do this. Let's see, I'm going to restart the service, and then I'll restart the client. Of course, it doesn't really matter. And we should be able to go. Let's see if everything's still working. Let's see. Here we go. Starting. Go, go, go. Looks okay. Now we go back to our service here. And you can see on port 9999, forward slash reservations, here are the names that we have so far. I want to post another record to the 9999 forward slash reservations endpoint. And the JSON I'm going to use is this. I'm going to add Dave using application JSON to this endpoint. Okay. So if I do that, oops, I should see Dave. So that was done by messaging. Right. So now I've got the ability to write and then to read, but even the reading is a little flimsy, don't you think? I mean, what happens in, in the case of one to more, one to end service instances, if that service should fall down, that'll, it'll still work, right? As long as I have one or more instances of that service, it'll route to another available instance. What happens if I have zero instances of the reservation service when I'm doing my reads? I want to be resilient, right? There's a guy named Fred George who does a great talk out of the UK in which he likens microservices or the human body, he likens them to uh, microservices. He suggests the very amazingly apropos idea. If you cut your finger, do you just blue screen? Right? Of course not, right? You, you, you gracefully degrade, as should your system. So let's go back to our, <laughs> let's go back to our um, service here and revisit this endpoint here that returns the, uh, uh, sorry, the reservation client. Let's revisit this endpoint that returns the string names. I want to fall back. I want to do something graceful if this service is not available. So I'm going to say, at enable circuit breaker. Now a circuit breaker is just what its name suggests. It's a, a component, a stateful component, that will see when something has failed and route traffic to some other endpoint. It's just like a circuit breaker in their home. I'd much rather lose the lights if there's an overwhelm or a surge of power 
than to lose the whole house because of a fire, right? So I'm going to say, at hystrix command, I'm going to say fallback method equals, and I'm going to give this a fallback method that will do something sort of trivial and safe, right? I mean, Netflix does this all the time. They'll say, oh, well, the search is down, for example, uh, but here are some recommendations from across the web instead. So you'll get something. It won't, you can't just send a, a stack trace back to your iPhone clients, right? That doesn't work. So we're going to teach our little service here to do the right thing when this, uh, when this service is down. I also want to be able to visualize when things are happening, you know, when, when calls are made from one service to another in a distributed system. If, if I call one service and that service calls another and the middle one dies, how do I correlate which request caused the trouble? How do I trace the flow of traffic through a system? And for that, you need visualization, right? So we're going to bring in something called Spring Cloud Sleuth, which is a distributed tracing. Uh, Zipkin? It's a distribu distributed tracing framework. It's part of Spring Cloud. And it works by adding a correlation ID across common ingress and egress points. So HTTP message calls, messaging, MVC calls, proxying, whatever. Uh, and you need to tell it, of course, which records to trace. And for our purposes, since this is a demo, we're going to tell it to always sample everything, to trace everything. I'm going to do the same thing in the service here. I'll say uh, trace everything. But of course, in a real production system, you definitely don't want to trace everything, right? You'll, if you have a bug and there's uh, problems with requests across multiple services, you'll see that bug with 20% of your traffic. You don't need to trace everything. You'll quickly overwhelm the system. Now, I also want to visualize this, right? I don't want to just point and type numbers. So I'm going to use something called Zipkin from Twitter, which is a distributed tracing tool. It's a great visualization. That's running on another port as well. Here we go. So now, let's see what happens. This should be up and running soon. Here's my registry. We'll see what comes back up to life. Reservation client is up first. Hello, service. No. Okay. Here we go. There we go. So there's the service. Now, if I go to this endpoint, does it work? No, it, fails th it falls through because it hasn't yet seen that there's a new service registered. So that's the distributed, that's the fall through, the circuit breaker working automatically. We got an empty collection. It fell back and gave us the empty collection instead of throwing an exception or blowing chunks. As the service comes back online and the client sees that the registry has now registered the new instance, it'll eventually heal, right? And if you're running on a cloud platform like Cloud Foundry or, or Heroku or whatever, it'll automatically restart that instance. So now you've got services that will automatically do the right thing. They'll gracefully degrade, and then uh, the service, the platform, will make sure that the services are running. But I still want to be able to visualize the flow of messages from one system to another. So I've, you know, that's why I've installed a Zipkin here, right? So there's my endpoint. You can see it's failing. I now want to go to uh, my Zipkin service here. Echo, Docker IP. PB copy. I'm going to say colon 8080 forward slash. And this is Zipkin from Twitter. Okay, This is a way of visualizing requests across different nodes. Uh, and it shows you a waterfall graph. So their service is now healed. I can go here and say, OK, show me all calls, be it from HTTP reservations or HTTP reservations names. Find traces. Uh, show me everything from like later on today, please. There we go. So there's the latest, this is the latest span. Here's from less than a minute ago. When I click on this, it shows me HTTP reservation names. I made this call. If I click on that, I can see the HTTP headers and the inbound and outbound uh, requests and the time it took from each service. And then I can see that it landed an HTTP reservation service on the service itself. So now I have the ability, and this works for messaging as well, right? So if I go to here and send another post request, which will trigger another HTTP call, I can now go back and view in Zipkin, I can view that the client has made a call. Reservation client. Uh, da -da, service. There you go. Here's the message input. Find the traces. This is about a minute ago. And you can see that it shows the HTTP reservation call being made. 
and then the message landing in RabbitMQ and the headers and so on there. So that gives you the ability to visualize what the system is doing. And we also saw that with the circuit breaker, I was able to gracefully degrade and do the right thing when the service came back online. So what have we covered? Not very much, let's be honest. Not a lot. We've talked about just a small fraction of the things that we support in Spring Cloud, including service registration, discovery, centralized configuration. We've talked about messaging and, and uh, uh, CQRS-style workflows. We've talked about distributed tracing using Spring Cloud Sleuth and Zipkin. Uh, we haven't talked about single sign-on using Spring Cloud Security, which lets you effortlessly protect using OAuth each of your individual REST services. We haven't talked about the Hystrix dashboard, which you can use to visualize the flow of requests into different systems and, and see the circuits as they, if they fall or if they open, you get a dashboard that shows you that. Um, what do you think? Yes, maybe? Pretty good? Okay. Um, I'm, I've got 30 seconds left. Should I do, I don't have 30 seconds anymore. I wanna say thank you so much for your time. I hope this was worth it. If you have questions, I'm uh, available outside or where, at the Pivotal booth. Um, I'm on the Twitters, like I said. So please, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you so much, everybody.